Hello, I'd like to welcome you all to the first day of the uh, conference. And this session is entitled Natural Resource Governance Between Revolution and Reform. There are beautiful examples of commons management and natural resources, as we saw from the many examples Silky provided yesterday. From the most ancient practices of managing natural commons, like water and pastures in the global south, to the delicate transformations of private management of resources like water in public common partnerships, as is taking place in the city of Naples, with the president of the water company with us today, Ugo Mate. However, at the moment, many of these examples remain disconnected. And although, as Silke says, we should be cautious about the issue of scaling up, this may be a time for the commons to catalyze a global and systemic change in our current economic system as opposed to remaining as islands in a sea of neoliberal policy. Unless we seek such a systemic change, these islands will continue to be assaulted and undermined by neoliberal logic and consistently squeezed between the state and market without addressing the assumptions of this logic and the way in which it has dominated life as we know it, then reform of the management of natural resources in this context can only mean the progress of, current neoliberal, of the current neoliberal paradigm as opposed to progress towards some alternative horizon shaped by commons values. And yet, the possibility of a mass popular revolution, a dramatic rupture with the past, without an anchor in the democratic and political system, as described yesterday very uh, nicely by Stefano Rodotà, uh, will unlikely to have long-lasting revolutionary impact, as we have seen in the many cases of revolution throughout the West. So what is the way forward in this case? The answer must lie between our notions of reform and of revolution, which seem to have lost the gravity of their meaning in today's context. Today's presentation is an effort to explore this space between these two categories in order to locate how the bottom-up practices of the commons could be supported by a shift in economic logic and the creation of new legal institutions to catalyze a systemic and global change. I'm very pleased to present the two keynote speakers, and I hope that we can learn from what they have to offer so that we can take their, their knowledge into the afternoon sessions and apply them to our unique cases of natural resource management. So I'd like to welcome first Ugo Mate is a professor of the University of Turin and an Alfred and Hannah Fromm Distinguished Professor of International and Comparative Law at the University of California, Hastings College of the Law. He has authored, authored over 100 publications and is a member of the Accademia Internazionale di Diritto Comparato. He's editor-in-chief of the Global Jurist, a member of the board of the American Journal of Comparative Law and of the International Review of Law and Economics. He is currently leading a study on commons for the Common Core of European Private Law and is one of the key figures in the Italian commons movement, not only in the context of the 2011 Italian referendum on water that we are very familiar with, I think, but also in the context of the high-speed trains in the Susa Valley and the occupation and transformation of theatres into commons in the case, for example, of the Teatro Valley in Rome. He is the current president of ABC Napoli, the first public common management of water in a large metropolitan area in Italy. I'd also like to introduce Joshua Farley. He is an ecological economist and associate professor in community development and applied economics and public administration. Joshua holds a degree in biology, international affairs, and economics, and he has previously served as program director at the School for Field Studies, Center for Rainforest Rainforest Studies, and an executive director of the University of Maryland International Institute for Ecological Economics. Uh, He recently returned from a Fulbright Fellowship in Brazil, where he served as a visiting professor at the Federal University of Santa Catarina and Bahia. His broad research interests focus on the design of an economy capable of balancing what is biophysically possible with what is socially, psychologically, and ethically desirable. More specifically, his research focuses on mechanisms for allocating resources under local control and national sovereignty. I'd like to give a warm welcome for these two speakers. Setting up. 
Right, so um, I'm actually going to give the perspective. I was trained as a neoclassical economist to be a neoliberal tool, you know, working for the IMF or World Bank. And uh, I don't refer to it as my doctorate degree. I refer to it as my indoctrination degree, and it never took. So I'm actually, one of the things I'm going to be focusing on here. So, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> this is a problem I have. Um, so um, I'm actually going to be taking the approach. I'm going to be trying to explain why from even within the framework of conventional economics, there are huge types of resource problems that can't be solved. And we desperately need alternative collective action tools to manage these resources. So I'm kind of taking a, a big picture view, not specific uh, commons approaches, but explaining, trying to explain clearly why we need collective action, some kind of commons ownership to deal with the most serious problems we face. Um, so uh, to begin with, I want to start out with what is economics. And economics, the conventional definition, is the allocation of scarce resources among alternative desirable ends, how we take what we have to create what we want. And within that definition, the first question you have to ask as an economist is what is it we want? What are our goals as a society? The second thing you have to look at is what resources do we have to attain those goals? And only then can you ask what mechanisms are appropriate for allocation. So do we use market mechanisms? Do we use common ownership? Do we use the public sector? The third question can only be answered in response to the first two. Conventional econ programs launch right into the third one. The answer to everything is free markets, and that's a very backward way of doing economics. So what is it, what is it we want? In fact, I will try to speak slowly, and I'll skip a few slides. My typical <laughs> approach is to put in more information and speak quickly. <laughs> but... So I would argue that, you know, all economists will agree that what we want to do is what they say, maximize utility, maximize some differential between pleasure and pain, well-being for all. So simply put, you could think of a high quality of life for this and future generations. The question is, how do we achieve that high quality of life? Some believe there's a wide range of human needs that need to be satisfied, that we have our physiological needs for health and food and sustenance, that we have needs to be healthy communities. We are people in community. We are not atomistic individuals. We need fulfilling social relationships. We need jobs that are meaningful and rewarding, that aren't work in that sense, but that are uh, something meaningful. So some of us would define that as the desirable ends. Conventional economists actually argue that we can't, we don't know what utility is. I don't know what you feel compared to what I feel. I don't know if you like oranges more than I like oranges. We can't make interpersonal comparisons. And therefore, the best we can hope for is to look at revealed preferences. I know what you want based on what you buy. And therefore, we can go from that to maximizing monetary value of everything bought and sold is the definition of utility is the goal of an economic system, is to maximize monetary value. And that is what neoclassical economics boils down to is the ultimate end for human welfare is maximizing monetary value. And they say we've achieved a way to do this that allows complete freedom of choice. So it's a very libertarian philosophy, freedom of choice, maximizing monetary values, those are the conventional goals. And I, you know, freedom of choice is a good one. Um, so I want to look at, uh, you know, whether or not our economic system can achieve this. So what do we have? What are the resources available to achieve these goals? So to begin with, we start from the laws of physics, a simple law of physics. You can't make something from nothing. Everything the economy produces requires raw materials from nature. You also can't do work without energy. 86% of the energy we use is fossil fuels. We use that energy to transform raw materials into something of value to humans. You can't make nothing from something. Everything we produce eventually returns to nature as waste. We burn a barrel of oil. It doesn't disappear. It becomes particulate matter and CO2 and dissipated heat energy. Um, and that disorder increases is a basic law of physics. Those are the law of physics, but we have to look at the laws of ecology. Those raw materials that we convert into economic products alternatively serve as the structural building blocks of our ecosystems. And structure generates function. 
A particular configuration of those structural building blocks creates these ecosystems that regulate atmospheric gases, regulate climate, regulate water flows, purify water, uh, pro are capable of reproduction. You need the system to reproduce. And these, so um, when we take that ecosystem structure to make economic products, we are degrading and transforming that ecosystem itself. The removal of structure and the return of waste degrades the function, which including these basic life support functions, which means that every time we produce something for the economy, we have a negative impact on global ecosystems and life support functions. And we need economic products to survive. There's no question. But we also need these basic life support functions of ecosystems to survive. Both of these are essential to civilization. And there's unavoidable trade-offs. You can't have the one, you can't have the economic products without affecting your ecosystem services. So um, we also need information to do any work. Any kind of economic activity requires information. And information is one of these things that improves through use. It's grass that grows greener the more you graze it, as we know from the commons literature. It plays an absolutely critical role in solving ecological problems. So if we want to transform to a post-carbon economy, we do need alternative forms of energy. We need to consume an awful lot less, but we need to use energy that doesn't destroy the environment. We need green technologies. We need all sorts of technologies to meet human needs. And the interesting thing about these technologies, the value, let's say we develop a clean, decentralized, alternative form to fossil fuels, the value of that resource, that knowledge, increases the lower the price goes. The value is maximized at a price of zero, which takes it completely outside the domain of conventional economics. And you can actually, this is within neoclassical analysis, you can show the value of information is maximized at a price of zero. So, you know, information automatically fails to conform to the rules of conventional economics. But I want to break this problem down. I want to break the economic problem down into two parts. And the first part is what I call a macro allocation problem. So we have this ecosystem structure that provides life-sustaining ecosystem functions, ecosystem services, or can be physically transformed into economic products also necessary for our survival. The challenge is how do we decide how much ecosystem structure to leave intact for humans and other species? and how much is available to transform to meet human needs. And so our goal here, it's sufficient well-being for humans and other species, um, now and in the future. And there's these, we're all in this together, these vital life support functions of a stable climate, a healthy ozone layer, water regulation, oceans capable of uh, you know, creating the oxygen, everything we need. These are shared by all. We can't have private ownership of these things. It's absolutely impossible to have private ownership, which means the decision about how much can be provided or should be provided will never be achieved by the market. This is something completely outside of the market domain. So what we... Um, there are potential like solutions to this problem. So the reform solution, the try to... There's this idea of incorporating these aspects of nature into the market. They talk about internalizing externalities through markets. And some of these things, I have to say, these things could buy us time. If they're the best we can get in the short run, they will buy us time until we achieve more meaningful solutions. But the basic idea, one approach, is price determines scale. We raise the prices of things that destroy the economy, and this will affect the scale. By scale, I mean that economy's capture of ecosystem structure for economic uses, we can affect prices, for example, through green taxes, and that will determine how much we use. The idea here, though, is, you know, what we love about the market is it's our individual freedom of choice. We decide what to do, we decide what to buy, what to produce, and the feedback mechanism of the price leads to this equilibrium outcome. But as soon as we have the state intervening to set prices, what you need is if, if it's true that every resource we take from nature burns energy, returns pollution, depletes ecosystem structure, there is a, and those things, markets don't capture those impacts, there's a non-market price for every economic good or service, 
And what these economists say is we have to get a team of technocrats to estimate that price, feed it to politicians, who will then feed it back into the economic system and incorporate it into economic prices. But in my view, this is a centralized pricing system. This is the antithesis of what markets are all about. So it's very interesting that to save the market, some economists want to essentially destroy what markets are supposed to be good at. Um, and that takes away our freedom. I would never have the freedom, you know, uh, uh, Exxon can pollute as much as it wants as long as it pays the tax. I have no freedom to have a clean, healthy environment. There's no freedom involved here. They have the freedom to pollute. They have to pay liabilities. But I do not, we do not have the freedom to a healthy uh, ecosystem. There's another approach that scale determines price. We decide, okay, there's a physiological or a bio, a ecological capacity of ecosystems to absorb CO2 or to purify water. We can limit waste emissions to within that ecological capacity. We ecology decides how much is available, and then we allow prices to adjust to that. The problem with this is if we step in and say there's a fixed amount of CO2 that can be emitted, you have to buy a permit to emit it, then we have a, a completely inflexible supply. Supply cannot adjust increases in price. The, supply incre the price increases rapidly with a small decrease in supply, which means that speculators are going to step in, they're going to snap these up, they're going to hold them back from the market, that's going to send the price skyrocketing upward. We'll get a wildly speculative economy that's destabilizing, creates bubbles, undermines you know, a healthy economy, and it's very difficult. I would argue instead for a more... Okay, I would argue instead for um, a more revolutionary approach, we internalize externalities by expanding who makes the decision. My decision to drive a car and spew CO2 is an externality if I make the decision. If we make this decision as a commons, as a collective, we get the benefits from burning fossil fuels. We pay the cost from burning fossil fuels. We have internalized the externality by redefining the decision-making unit to encompass all of us. And we then focus on first ecological sustainability. How much damage can we do to ecosystems? Second, who is entitled to those the surplus resources available? Distribution issue comes second. Only third do you worry about the specific allocation, what specific activities get those resources. Um, and uh, because I'm speaking slow, I will do, be a little less elaboration on some topics. There's, but once we've decided, once we've decided that here are the resources, the ecosystem structure that has to be set aside uh, to meet basic life support functions for humans and other species, there's now this surplus that can be allocated among other uses. How do we decide how to use that surplus? I call this the micro-allocation problem. How do we use available ecosystem structure to produce different economic products? And the question is, do markets achieve this efficiently? And I want to look at examples of water, land, food, and energy quite quickly, about a minute each, I guess. Um, and uh, so first, I want to say that markets and essential resources. So there's essential resources we need, absolutely need. Food, land, water, energy, these things are necessary. Market advocates say markets maximize utility. But market demand is preferences weighted by purchasing power. My preferences mean nothing if I have no purchasing power to back it up, which means that exchange value trumps use value in a market. And to take a look at a concrete example of this, in 2007-2008, the price of grains, corn and rice doubled, the price of wheat tripled. What happened to consumption of wheat and uh, corn, rice in the U.S. and Germany? It went up because we spend such a small, such a small part of our purchasing power spent on food, we don't care about the price. Countries that consume less than 2,000 calories a day saw their consumption plunge. Countries that consume more than 3,000 calories a day actually increase their consumption. My view is that markets allocate resources to those who need them the least. We're weighting preferences by purchasing power. We're allocating resources to the overfed instead of the underfed. We're minimizing utility in an unequal world through market allocation. We're making, you know, there's no question that reallocating wealthy uh, food from the, the uh, overfed to the underfed makes everyone better off. Um, so now let's take a look at the case of water. Water is very interesting because it's what economists refer to as a natural monopoly. It makes 
no sense to have. So what we do is we have a huge reservoir, huge water lines, huge fixed cost, major investment. If you have one household on that system, you divide those fixed costs among one household. Is each additional household is very, very cheap to add to that system. It would make no sense if you replicated, if you had competition in the water sector, 10 different companies with a reservoir and uh, main lines going to your house, that would increase costs tenfold. Competition increases costs for resources with this characteristic. On the other hand, you can minimize costs with a monopoly, but if it's a for-profit monopoly, you can charge any price you want. Markets cannot solve the water problem. The so the first problem is how do we make sure there's enough water for all species and humans? Next problem, channeling water to people's houses. Markets simply cannot do that. If we do have markets and try to maximize profits, you look at who is willing to pay for the water. South Africa tried to raise their prices to reflect costs of provision. Rich people kept buying drinking water to flush their toilets and fill their swimming pools. Poor people could not afford drinking water to keep their kids from dying from dysentery and had to drink from the rivers into which those toilets were flushed. So what we see then is, you know, we started a cholera epidemic, enormous costs for doing that. So I do have to finish up now. Um, I was going to go on with a couple of other issues, but I basically want to say that um, what we need is certain problems cannot be solved through the market. This macro allocation problem, ensuring ecological sustainability, can't be solved through markets. We need some kind of collective action, some kind of comments. Just distribution of resources can't be solved through markets. Um, markets are inefficient when resources are essential and, uh, um, you know, or not depleted through use. So basically, you know, we need to have... Um, Decide how we allocate resources, not based on our ideology, but on our desirable lens and the physical characteristics of those resources. The most serious problems we face simply cannot be solved by markets. We really do need collective action and common ownership. And uh, i got to stop now. Um, normally, I speak twice as fast, would have gotten in twice as much, but it uh, doesn't work with translators. So... Um, Good morning. First, let me comment very briefly on the title of the conference to put my remarks in context. Uh, commons and economics. Um, I come from an experience uh, that is called law and economics. And law and economics ended up being economics conquering the law. Okay, so hopefully the fact that we put it economics before, as a matter of politeness, will be the commons that conquer economics and not the other way around. But there is always a risk when we use two terms that one over, over, over takes the other. Okay, so that was a point that I wanted to make in terms of developing a field of research. We are giving a lot of space to economics, at least in, in, our, in our title. I don't know whether we can do it in our uh, working the commons. The other thing that I wanted to, to start to just a few words about is this idea of revolution and reform. Uh, revolution has been never used as much as these current years in which it's not happening. I mean, lot of, there is a lot of talks about revolution going on. You know, there are political parties that are called revolution, uh, and revolution is not happening. So um, revolution and reform uh, can be seen from the perspective of revolution, and that uh, ended up becoming somewhat kind of an internal thing. We say, okay, we talk about revolution, but it's not re the real thing. You know, it's a kind of a transformation, a deep transformation of our Weltanschauung, the way we see the things. That's a way to look at revolution that you know, can be satisfactory or not. I don't find it particularly satisfactory. But the same thing is happening to the reform also. I, I, I've been working a little bit on this notion of reform recently. Reform used to mean achieving gradually the result that revolution achieves fast, okay? So in the, in the socialist tradition, there would be like the maximalist tradition that does the revolution like, you know, getting the winter palace. 
And on the other hand, there would be the reformist strategy to get to the same result. You build a socialist society in a more gradualistic way by using the current institutions. That was the meaning of reform. Today, when we talk about reform in the neoliberal order, that means exactly the opposite. Reform means rather than a process of gradual inclusion and construction of a society that is more equal, reform today means something the opposite. It seems transferring as much as possible of public resources in the private domain. It means creating structures that make government stable, makes possibility to decide, makes the law market friendly, creates flexibility in, ma- in, in, in labor markets. So reform today is basically a process of privatization of the public sector. That's what we mean by reform. You know, political parties say, oh, I'm for reform, and the idea is I want to create a system that is market-friendly, efficient, good for competition. So reform really shifted meaning as well. And this shift of meaning on reform, and I'm going to get right into the talk that I'm trying to give here, I'm going to share with you a very practical experience, which is the experience of the water privatization slash republicization in Naples. And this is a quite interesting, is a quite in- interesting experience because it brings us to how do you get to a point in which you transform a society by putting more commons at the center of the stage. And yesterday there were some of that questions, and there were in the remarks in the afternoon, someone asked, well, how are we going to deal with the corporation? What is going to happen? You know, we are talking about commoning and creating common structure and common institution, but then we leave the real thing to corporations. Corporations are more and more strong. They conquer more and more spaces that used to be public. Actually, one of the best definitions of neoliberalism is really the transfer of public spheres into corporate hands. That's the real structure of neoliberalism. So in Naples, we kind of tried to go the other way around. After the referendum of 2011, the idea was, is it possible to take a corporation, a private corporation, with a private corporate form, so a for-profit corporate form, and transform it into a public corporation that is a non-for-profit form that is not really owned by, not just substituting the ownership of the private sector or with the public sector. Actually, the company, the private company in Naples was actually owned by the city of Naples that was making profit on that, okay? Now, how are we going to turn and transform into something different? How are we going to do that? First of all, there is one thing, that you're not going to transform as a reform. You're not going to transform a private corporation into something public uh, by commoning. It's not like, you know, a gala dinner. It's not something that you're going to say, okay, come in and do it, okay? You need a lot of non-commoning authority to make the transformation. That was I learned in these last couple of years. You need to go there, you need to get in the bottom room, you need to struggle for power, and you need then to create and to transform the bylaws of the corporation in such a way that the corporation then, eventually, will stop acting as a corporation. And you have to introduce control so that this thing can happen and last. Okay? And this is something that really requires you know, some sort of non-sharing attitude. Because there are lots of vested interests in corporations. There are lots of vested interests in corporations. So if you change the vision, the vision of the corporation is very simple. Profit. And everybody who holds shares, no matter whether it's the public sector or the private sector, the moment in which someone holds shares is only interested in the value of these shares and the return the share grant. You know? So there are public corporations, private corporations owned by the public, here the public-private is where it really gets tricky, that behave as much as sharks as privately owned corporations. Because the politicians in the city need those shares, the value of those shares and that money at the end of the year in order to carry on the business of the city and the municipality. Okay? 
So you're not going to have friends, neither in the private sector nor in the public sector, in trying to do this kind of transformations. That's one point. So you are not getting to a common institution by commoning practices in a reformist way, that is, in a way that respects the law. You can get to commoning institutions by commoning practices if you are willing to break the law. Okay, so this is one very important thing. There are things that are compatible with the given legal order and things that are not. Okay, if you want to follow the, the given legal order, the given legal order is hierarchical, is based on concentration of power, and you need to play with those rules. You can create rules of commoning, you know, if you occupy a theater, for example. Now, you occupy a place, and then you create, you do the way you want. If you have enough force, or if the politicians are scared enough not to try to kick you off, then you can build the commons from the scratch. But if you are trying to build the commons by playing at the rules, you need concentration of power for a while. Okay, that's one point. Second point, which, was, which I experienced this last year and a half, is that the neoliberal legal order is extremely unbalanced. This is a big problem. No matter whether you love the, 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 the legal order or not, doesn't matter whether you are a revolutionary guy or a reformist, you are going to face a legal system that is imbalanced in favor of the private. The law makes it extremely easy to privatize. There is nothing easier than privatizing resources. If you are a municipality, you want to sell your you know, gas company or your water company or whatever you want to sell, you're going to find it very, very easy from the legal point of view. The law helps you. The law favors you. Not the law in general, the neoliberal legal order that was developed in the West beginning in the early 90s. We transformed and we changed our civil code, for example, that deals with transformations. We have all sorts of rules on how to privatize that facilitate the privatization process, the transformation of public entity into private corporations. There are no laws in the Italian legal order, and we did some comparative research, and there is not much even elsewhere, that shows you how to go the other way around. What, if, what, what happens if, after you have privatized something, you change your mind? You say, okay, I have privatized the water company system, because they thought I was like in the neoliberal dreaming of the mid-90s, and they thought it was a good idea. Now, after 15 years, I say, you know what? It not, was not a good idea. It was a mistake. Now, can I come back? The answer is simply no. Or at least you can do it, but you need to force the legal system by interpretation. There is no way you can find an easy pathway that is indicated by the legal system to do that. And it took us an, a year and a half of hard work and research to find legal ways to interpret Article 2500 of the Italian Civil Code in such a way that the transformation from the private to the public would be actually something uh, possible to apply and to extend in the transformation to, for, uh, in the other way around. Okay, so that needed study. You need interpretation in order to interpret, then you need what? You need something around you that gives you a good argument that the logic of the neoliberal law is not serving the interest of the collectivity. So that, that can you find and persuade either a notary or a judge that your interpretation is a good interpretation, which is a clear interpretation that is outside of the law, let's face it. The transformation of the Naples corporation into a public entity is, technically speaking, an illegal act in the sense that it is a ex very extensive interpretation of the law that was possible only because at some point the Constitutional Court interpreted the referendum results of 2011 in such a way that the court said, okay, there is a people will that should be respected, that the water should be public, and therefore there should be public institutions that are capable to make us govern the water. And so after the decision of the Constitutional Court, we were able to find an notary that said, what the heck, you know, I'm going to take the risk. And I'm going to draft you know, the transformation so that the transformation can happen. 
Okay? And that is only one part, because once you're done with that, then you have a lot of fiscal issues. There are huge fiscal issues, because the legal, is not, the legal system is actually creating so many difficulties for the attempts to go from the private into the public that the tax law is after you. So you do the thing, and then you, find, you get stuck into taxation issues. Complicated, to be interpreted. A lot of money in lawyers. Labor law issues. Huge labor law issues. You know, you were private, now you are public. So what does that mean? How do you hire people? How is your labor contract going to become? Okay, huge issues also from that point of view. So there is a lot of work to be done, to be done for lawyers, and that work and that works is damn expensive. Okay, and has to be faced and tackled in a way that is. And this and we are here just to the form. Then you get to the substance. What does it mean to actually transform a corporation? from a for-profit into an ecological, commons-based corporation. You need to change the bylaws. So the purpose, the DNA of the corporation should be different. Okay? So the corporation is not there to make profit. It's there to run the water system in an ecological, sustainable, long-term way so that it takes into consideration the needs of the society that it's serving. We are serving there one million people, we have a business that is almost 200 million a year activity. So we are talking about we are talking about a serious corporation with a lot of investment money. Okay, to run that in a way that is that works and is stable is difficult. Also, from the point of view of managerial skills, it's not like running you know a little device or a little bakery shop. It's a different thing because you are facing uh, you are facing the structures and the difficulties of the real life of the law, which is not friendly to our agenda, is not friendly to the idea of reform that we might, we might have in mind here. So once you did the transformation and you changed the bylaws, and we did that, then you have to check that this purpose, this ecological commons purpose, is in some way respected by the new entity. And here is where we are now. This is really another kind of tricky thing, because if you are a for-profit corporation, you have a very natural way to check whether you're doing good or, or, or bad, and that is profit. If you're making money, you are a good corporation. If you're losing money, you are a bad corporation. It's very simple. There is an agency of control, and that agency of control is called the market. Once you get to a commons device, I'm done, this, this agency of control is not out there, and so you need to create it. You need to create it because, you know, it's not the market. You need to lose money in a certain perspective. But the money, yeah, you need to lose money. But the money you are losing, you need to show that you are actually gaining it back from the kind of money you are saving to the old system, to the commons, in the, by the ecological way you are running the system. Okay? So we haven't lost money the first year and a half. Now we have created, actually, a system to check that is based on participation. If I had more time and if you have any curiosity, I'm, I'm ready to talk, but I need another five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much to Joshua and Ugo for these very excellent talks. In, in, um, in the spirit of sharing the time that we have, and because both of us, both of the keynote speakers needed a little bit of extra time, I'd like to invite you all to the afternoon session on natural resource management, and we will have a full one hour of question and answer with the two keynote speakers. So it, it, please come to the session if you're interested in asking questions, and thank you so much again.
So right to the next stream. Good morning, everybody. I've been introduced yesterday. You cannot hear? Yes. Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, I've been introduced yesterday by Barbara, and uh, welcome to the Red Dot Stream, doing away with labor, working and caring in a world of commons which I have co coordinated. And of course, we all know that this is rather meant to provoke, and that if women were to stop going into labor, our human species would cease to exist. In this stream, you are invited to join our expeditions into rethinking the role of human reproductive activity and its inherent nature in a generative commons network. And yes, we want to do away with the rather predominant notion of labor as employment and as a commodity that we buy and sell in the market and reframe our understanding of employment as what is behind and this behind is employability, the human capacity or ability to work. We then can consider these plentiful capacities as a common pool resource and move from there to imagine what it would take to organize it as a commons. This framing session now will be followed after lunch by the first labor stream breakout session that will feature six different speakers and they will in their own individual speakers' corners drill deeper, challenge or recapture aspects that the following keynote will touch upon. We have invited Daniela Gottschlich for this keynote. She is a political scientist at Leuphana University in Lüneburg. <coughs> Feminist theory and practice is the academic and political environment Daniela comes from and the care economy is the perspective from where she approaches the commons debate. We have chosen her to present as a younger generation feminist who has inherited and carries on the fruits of long years fights and discussions that the preceding generation of feminists has contributed to reframe the economy from a feminist economics perspective. And it is an absolute necessity to flag and honor these contributions. Now, I was to say it's all yours, Daniela. Unfortunately, Daniela is very sick today and she had to stay in bed in Lüneburg and she has sent me her prepared material, but you all know that it is not easy to pre present on somebody else's behalf. But I'm now trying to replace her. I had to mess around <laughs> with Daniela's material to fit it for 30 minutes, but we will upload the full presentation and text for whoever is interested to go after it. Daniela, our best wishes from here. Get better soon. So I think now I'm starting... Switch it. Okay. So, in our exchange and debates with feminists and feminist economists, such as Friederike Habermann, for example, who is here, or Veronica Benhold Thompson, who couldn't make it this time, or Adelheid Biesecker and now in preparation for this uh, framing session with Daniela again, a key interest from a commons perspective um, is the structural commonalities between caring and commoning. So let's examine this. 
So similarities of uh, both concepts are that they criticize the prevailing economic rationale, they emphasize the human dimension, that means the wealth must meet the livelihood needs of the people rather than to serve the markets. They are both based on cooperation and responsibility. They are relational. They must be constantly created and recreated. They embody an ethics of care, ethics of reciprocity that point to many possible ways out of social and ecological crises. So if we have examined the uh, similarities, what are then the differences? So we are uh, comparing common space peer production and care work to make this comparative exercise imaginable. But of course, common space peer production is not equally 100% to commoning. Whereas in common space peer production, activities work, um, uh, um, activities or work um, are self-determined and of individual choice. In care work, reproductive activities, um, we have to do with activities that the society cannot do away uh, with, cannot do without, it's indispensable. Whereas in common space peer production, humans are considered to be socially independent. In the care work, humans are considered to be fragile beings. You know that half of our lives we are dependent on others in young age and then again when we are old and need care. Whereas in common space peer production, we have symmetrical cooperation between people with equal rights and equal status. In the care, we have asymmetrical cooperation between caregiver and care receiver. And in care, it is because the work is indispensable, impossible to withdraw from caring, whereas if you're fed up with a peer community, to just drop out, go for another one. So that means there are structural commonalities between these two practices, but they are not interchangeable. These differences indicate a core question for our stream, how to combine caring and commoning in order to ensure the reproduction of society as a whole. Let's now shed some light onto the thinking of feminist economists and look at this link between organization of care and commons. Feminist economists consider the services of nature, the productivity or reprodu reproductivity of nature, subsistence activities, and the unpaid care activities as the foundation for all ec economic activities. The prevailing economic system, however, makes these realities invisible. Much, uh, much like the ecological productivity of living nature, unpaid care activities are excluded from the economics. Well, and there are trends to account the value and monetize these activities. I will return to these questions and the related problems. So if you now look at this uh, small tip of the iceberg, it beautifully depicts how flawed our system and thinking is. We really need to put this upside down. So imagine this as an ice cone instead. How much yummy good life ice cream could we share and lick together? In the prevailing understanding of economics, um, market economics, um, uh, uh, economics uh, is restricted to market economy processes, following strictly monetized determination. Whereas in life provisioning e economics, such as care activities or nature, uh, nature and ecosystem productivity, are considered of low value. Whereas 
Yeah, a feminist eco uh, economics criticizes the structural division between productive work and care work and its different validation. And this separation is linked to systemic mechanisms such as externalization, devaluation, exploitation. And these processes are the underlying causes for the crisis of reproductivity. So feminist economists, however, stress the productivity of reproductive activities. And commoners would formulate that as the inherently generative power of reproductive activities. So uh, we call for the conscious design of the whole of economics and the whole of necessary work, the whole of the absolutely indispensable work to ensure the whole for our livelihood pro provisioning. This means to consider all types of human activity that has uh, so far been externalized. So now, how do we restructure, reorganize, rethink work? The whole of work concept is also critical of what we call gainful employment or paid labor. And this is because it is either alienating us from core activities for life provisioning or because it is precarious or in other words, we should live to work and not work to live. And work should be fun as much as possible. So what do we need instead? We need a system that enables social reproduction without social and ecological destruction. We need to switch perspectives, use the principle of care economics and commons economics to transform the current economic system as a whole. And we have to maintain social and ecological qualities. So what are the challenges? We have to see and fully understand human and natural reproductive activity as an integral part of all commoning and bring about cultural civilizational change, overcome the dominance of the pre uh, prevailing economic logic. So this means changing our understanding and ways of life and work not only requires rethinking and re-evaluating, but also new language a commonified language, maybe. Um, now, there are three stories, actually, um, that are to illustrate the crisis of reproductivity that needs to be overcome, include visions of transformation and attempt to combine caring and commoning and, of course, to raise questions. So... This is the first story. This is Jan. Um, Jan is a student. He does computer design, communication design, and um, business administration here in Germany. He likes to share music, films, and he develops free software. He is a fan of Marcin Jakubowski's open source ecology. He produces a networked labor. He dreams of working in a co-working space once he's done with his studies. And he is really needs-oriented. With his 3D printer, he can develop a lot of stuff that he doesn't need to buy in the market that he produces just for himself. Just food he cannot print out yet, and that's not a joke. NASA is actually looking into these options to send astronauts into space and then print their food from a 3D printer. So since his uh, printer does not really produce that, his fridge is empty, he calls Hang Shong a um, food caterer. He is paid less than three hours, uh, three euro per hour. He's from China. He works seven days a week at a restaurant, more than 10 hours a day. His boss has taken away his passport and he is exploited in the global production chains. This story has been carried to a human rights organization here in Berlin. So, and what he has in his little bag, 
Chinese dog, and that one was grown um, in an industrialized site. So a duck is a bird which likes to swim, it never swam in a pond. And um, animal rights activists would call that torture breeding. So what does this story tell us, actually? Um, Jan is young, he has no children yet, no relatives or friends in need of care, at least at the moment. So the question is, do all people with their different biographical backgrounds have the same opportunities to become a commoner or peer-to-peer -peer producer? The story also illustrates that the market considers reproductive activities such as preparing meals, for example, as service of little value. And Hong Shang and the uh, nameless duck represent the destructive components of the prevailing production processes. So the story indicates the question, what kind of quality and purpose of work do we want? Like decentralized, non hierarchical all-inclusive, what is the quality for work we want to promote? <coughs> and in a world of caring and commoning, we need to create new relations between people, society and animals, and non-human nature. So I have another story for you. That's Sonia. Sonia is a caregiver in an elderly home. And this is emotionally challenging work. Um, she really likes the work she does, but she's poorly paid. And there are ever stricter requirements for nursing care. So all activities are accounted for in, for in time units. And like certain services, uh, because they need to increase efficiency to save money and time for their services, certain services are banned to be taken onto the counting sheet. Like, for example, emptying the letterbox for the care receiver that she's visiting. Um, Sonia herself, because she doesn't earn so much, is worried about her old age and how she will actually live. So she thinks of maybe going into a multi-generational house. Or she may also consider, um, or she actually doesn't like to consider what her neighbor does, um, because her neighbor has hired Ola from Poland uh, as a caretaker. Um, and <laughs> so she considers maybe it's better to getting older in community. So what, that, what does that story tell us? This is an example which very, very much comes from this uh, German background here. So elder care works poorly paid, it's provided by the market, but poorly paid. Mm -hmm. Working conditions getting work, uh, worse, and nursing has been transformed into pieces, uh, into piece work. Um, and then we also see the, that uh, care, which is provided in the families, not through uh, an employment as Sonia's job, um, that caregivers are under extremely high psychological and physical stress, and they are unpaid and the gender division of labor still persists. And we also see in this example the emerging transnational ethnicized care chains. Sonia and Ola and Ola may provide for the needs of her family by hiring an Ukrainian woman that does the job in Poland then. So what's needed is a paradigm shift, a new evaluation or valuation um, criteria, appreciation of care work, as a prerequisite for all other types of work. And we have to ask the question, who is responsible for ensuring this generative reproductivity of our society? A last story, this is the third story. Um, that's Marlin. Marlin actually um, is a mother of two. And yesterday evening, she was in a meeting with um, other peer parents and they discussed the question whether they should actually really, whether domestic labor should be paid. So um, Marlin has captured news from Venezuela where they are thinking of introducing basic income for mothers. So she finds that interesting and wants to bring that to her peer group. So she's also a good friend with Nila. Nila is from India and she has heard about uh, women uh, raising up there and criticizing the economic system 
but they want their work to be recognized and, and, and respected, but they don't really want a monetization of all these activities. And here we have a young couple, Christine and Murad. Um, they are parents and they are both full-time working, so for them it's really hard to balance both. And they even uh, consider uh, to um, go for extra hours so that they can afford to buy services to have somebody clean or look after the children. <coughs> so we have this problem of connecting the separation between life and work. And um, this evening, uh, Marlin um, has found a caretaker because she wants to go to an event where she can listen to a speaker from the US who is introducing the concept of time-based economics where labor is actually Every hour of labor is, is, is valued equally. So, um, one of the key issues which comes out of this is the question whether monetizing uh, and uh, yeah, mo uh, reproductive activities or even care of, and, uh, of and, and nature services both is an option. Because... Um, I mean, most feminists say no, and I guess that commoners would also agree that's not really the solution. I mean, Joshua was relating to externalization, and this actually means we have to internalize. But um, then we really run straight into the pricing trap. How do we actually overcome this externalization of care work and nature services without falling into this prices, pricing trap? And if left unattended, um, it can really lead straight into the economization of life. And then, there of, of course, uh, there is this livelihood protection trap uh, because we don't really know who cares in a world in which we care for others but still need money to survive. And there's also the time tra uh, trap, as the example of Murat and Christine said, who struggle with this famous work-life balance huh? that we also talk so much about and which is so deeply ingrained in our, in our mental setups. But this really <coughs> indicates that separation. So let me now conclude. Um, the market economy creates a distance between us and the consequences of our own actions. We see neither the working conditions under which people like Hong Chong have to suffer in the global uh, production chain, nor do we see the factory farming in northern Germany when buying cheap food. While the market seems to take away responsibilities due to the distance it creates, caring and commoning require proximity and responsibility. Care is relational. This means strengthening moral values and social norms are of extreme importance. Hence, we can conclude that the aim of developing a new way of living and working is twofold. First, expressing radical criticism of the destructive market logic and making efforts to push, to push it back and working on a vision. But we have to differentiate between the different levels of discussion, criticism or vision, transition strategy or options that have already been implemented, or those that are still evolving in our imagination. Creating new working environments, as I have descri described in the first story of Jan as a networker, helps us to blur the distinction between producer and consumer, leading us to the notion of the prosumer. <coughs> but prosumption does nevertheless not yet mean that we have fully overcome the separation of these two spheres of production and reproduction. So yet, um, they remain two sides of one and the same coin, namely reproductivity. The aim is to shape the whole of all those activities that are required for a resilient livelihood provisioning system, and this leads us, amongst others, to the vision of reprosumption. We will have to use this combined uh, vision to reorganize work. Rethinking the role of human reproductive activity and its inherent nature in a generative commons network 
begs the question of how to ensure a fair balance of responsibility between individual and collective, responsibility between men and women, between people of different ethnic origin, between Global North and Global South, and so on. So reduction of working hours, minimum wages, decent working conditions, social and ecological standards are all essential on the way to bringing about change. There are transition strategies. But all of these actions refer to the remodeling of employment or paid, paid labor. This is undoubtedly very, very important. But there will only be room for paid employment or for employment in this vision of new working environments if it promotes the means for a good life for each individual, for the society and for nature. Paid labor will no longer be at the heart of work since it also includes alienated work or alienating work, which is part of the problem. And last but not least, it is up to trade unions to face up to the challenge of redefining their activities to embrace this new trend, reorganizing work not just for, but as a good life. So for this vision to be realized, we need new alliances, a variety of strategies to match the complexity of the various transformation requirements, since there is no blueprint for such a transformation, and we need room for collective thinking and experimenting. So, on the road to changing thoughts, perceptions, values, and judgments, there are still more questions than answers. So, we will have to explore them one by one, find answers and solutions. And I finally like to invite you to further explorations of rethinking the role of human reproductive activity in the red dot stream after the lunch break. So now we are coming to the third keynote, and I'm very happy to announce uh, Miguel Vieira. He's a Brazilian researcher and activist working with commons and commodification. Good morning. I want to begin by thanking the CSG for this invitation. Working on the stream has been very challenging, uh, particularly for the following reason. Uh, if Commons is a concept that only recently re-entered the, the public debate, its relationship with infrastructure is still an even less explored territory. I'm an activist, I do, and I do academic research on, on commons and commodification, but I'm hardly an expert on, on that specific matter, infrastructure. But I hope I can convince you that uh, building commons, enabling infrastructures, is something really crucial if we want to advance commons as a paradigm. So, short summary of what I'm going to talk about today. First, what are infrastructures? What do I mean by infrastructure here? What are most infrastructures like today? Then I'll present two challenges in moving forward to more commons enabling infrastructures. And I'll finish by presenting some emerging examples of alternative uh, experimentations with infrastructure. 
and the tensions that underlie them. So what, what I mean by infrastructures here? Infrastructures are systems that enable and mediate certain activities. They usually have material aspects, such as goods and services, and also immaterial aspects, social relations, which are blended together. Infrastructures are produced in the sense of socially and historically constructed. They're not naturally given. This is something important. And particularly important to take into account when we're thinking about the social relations aspect. Our current dependence on markets, for instance, is not something written in stone in human nature, but rather a consequence of social relations that we have produced. But going back to that definition, many goods and services we produce can also be seen as tools that enable us to do certain activities. Say, for example, a car. A car, so, a car also enables us to do certain things, to go places or to do other things. Why don't we think of a single car as an infrastructure? Well, the reason is that an infrastructure, as the word suggests, lies beneath and, and extends beyond an individual or, or small case or small scale use of tools for an activity. Infra, as you probably know, is Latin for beneath. In this example, the infrastructure is not the car itself, but the, the single car, but the system of roads, traffic signals, and traffic rules. Traffic rules are particularly important in, in this example. They're necessary because the infrastructure can involve the usage of a huge set of resources, say roads, for instance, by many different actors. This implies that infrastructures are eminently social systems. But just as a side note, this does not mean that the car is, by contrast, a purely objective thing. A car also implies social relations. A car is built by hundreds of workers. It's usually bought by wage labor and so on. With infrastructures, however, the social aspect is much more prominent because of the shared usage. So there are many reasons to explain why this kind of shared usage by multiple actors is convenient. We can think of, for instance, the, the infrastructure might be too expensive to be provided individually, as is the case of a, a railroad. It also might be related to activities that require some degree of coordination, protocols, or some collective agreement, say the use of, of spectrum in, in, in communications. Or it could be related to activities that we socially value and see as basic rights, and thus we collectively decide to undertake in common, as in the case of public health, education, sanitation. This shared and social character of infrastructures also means that they have the potential to be uh, commons, to be related to commons. Unfortunately, that potential is not exactly what we see happening the most today. Most of the current infrastructures are designed to favor and extend commodity production. This is one first characteristic. The second one is that many of the existing infrastructures foster individualistic and environmentally destructive behavior. But I'll get back to the second characteristic later. First, let me open a parenthesis here to clarify the distinction between commodities and commons. When I, when I talk about commodity production here, I should warn you that I'm using a less known meaning of this term. I'll try not to bore you with the academic lingo, but I'm mostly building upon Marx and Kaupolani's definitions of commodities. Commodities for them are goods produced to a very specific set of social relations. Private producers are in general separated from, from workers who, not, who do not own means of production and from consumers who are related to uh, the production only by the market. Also in the sphere of commodities, production and reproduction of life are separated. The labor to manufacture a car and say the unpaid labor done by uh, a woman in her family's household are treated as if they were funda fundamentally different something we saw on the previous presentation by Heike. 
And what's most important for my argument here, markets play an essential role in commodity production. They are the tool to decide what should be produced and how much of it. Something that also came up in, in, Josh, in Joshua's presentation. This is problematic as markets are almost an indirect index of societal needs. What they're really good at is measuring profitability. Commons, on the other hand, are things shared, things shared by a community and the social practices, the commoning, necessary to maintain this sharing, including the production, the production of such things in some cases, their maintenance, their distribution, and so on. Unlike with commodities, the markets in commons are not a, a mandatory additional mediating instance. The, the commons itself fulfills the role of determining what should be produced and how it should be distributed. Also, in commons, productive and reproductive activities are not necessarily distinguished. This might happen, but this is not uh, necessary to, the, to how commons work. So after this parenthesis, it should be clear that most infrastructures built until today favor commodity production instead of commons. Even though the majority of this infrastructure was built by states and not by private actors. In Brazil, that's where I come from, there are clear examples of this with infrastructures built for mining and agribusiness. Much of Maristela Svampa's talk yesterday applies here. Uh, so we, we have in Brazil large dams for powering aluminum processing industries, uh, public research centers concentrating on their efforts in sugarcane or soy research. All this investment fuels activities such as mining and monocultures, which are environment, environmentally destructive, which profit large export-driven corporations, and which are socially corrosive as they kill jobs and livelihoods, they promote dispossession, and they make food production more expensive as they compete for land. Finally, aside from state-run infrastructures, there are also those infrastructures that are fully integrated with commodity production, either because they were privatized or because from the start they were built to be sold as commodities by private actors. And now back to that second characteristic of infrastructures which is clearly related to the, first, to the previous one. Most of current infrastructures foster individualistic behavior, behavior that is environmentally destructive as well. An obvious, an obvious example is the prevailing car culture. I think Goofy here illustrates well this, the, the individualist, individualistic aspect of it. Uh, we should not forget, though, this, that this individualism is also not intrinsic to human nature, but owes a great deal to public efforts and investment in infrastructures that favor, favored automobile and oil industries. For instance, in urban planning in the USA, and in the case of industri industrialization policies in Latin America in the second half of the past century. Well, this something that's important also to mention is this is, by definition, not common, not commons enabling. Individualism goes uh, is problematic when, when when we're thinking of commons. So now that I've painted quite a green picture of our current context, let us step back a little and, and reflect about what could or needs to be done to change that, so that we can have progressively more commons enabling infrastructures. In that sense, I'll propose two, two challenges. The first one is to turn existing infrastructures into commons. This boils down to questions such as, how can communities appropriate themselves of existing state-provided infra infrastructures and put them to work for commons? How to make the, the management of these infrastructures more directly democratic? In this challenge, it is also important to recognize the limitations and affordances of certain kinds of infrastructures. Consider car sharing initiatives. They are creative and certainly useful ways, probably even necessary ways, to minimize the problems of car, of car culture. 
but they don't change the underlying infrastructure, which still disfavors collective or hum human power transportation over fossil fuel-based individual commodities, cars. We must be aware of those limitations, but that certainly shouldn't stop us from strategically working within them. The second challenge is to turn commons into infrastructures on a wider societal level. Well, many commons are indeed infra infrastructures, if we take that definition, of, a definition of systems that enable multiple actors to do certain activities. Many commons, though, are, are quite topic-specific. For instance, a, free software, a specific free software project, or are restricted, restricted geographically. The issue then becomes, how can they be expanded, proliferated, and networked so that our society is less dependent on commodities? Well, I really wanted to say that don't panic. I, I have the ready answers to those two challenges, life, the universe, and everything else, but obviously I don't. What I'm going to do instead in the final part of this talk is presenting a few examples of an alternative approach to, to infrastructures that might be more commons enabling. These are most def definitely not the only ones that are, that are out there. And I chose them because they may highlight interesting tensions and contradictions that appear in this context. Or particularly in the final case, because I suspect many people are not familiar with them. So I'll start by just mentioning very briefly two examples. The first is called GuifiNet, and it's a large and successful community-shared computer network. One tension that it displays is its sort of fragility, as most, uh, most of the rest of the Internet's infrastructure is private and not a commons, the infrastructure itself. Uh, GuifiNet is connected to the Internet, and that's one of the main uh, usages that, that, that it offers. But that connection is certainly a strategical bottleneck. Another example is the use of smart grids for decentralized energy production. While they could help some uh, energy producing commons based initiatives, it would add a mark to help those, those initiatives to sustain themselves. It would add a market layer if those initiatives wanted to share energy among themselves. They, also, they would always have to go through the market to, to, to share energy between different commons initiatives. Uh, also, the trend, favori, the trend that favors smart grids nowadays is not driven by commons. It's, it's cl clearly driven by the, the green capitalist paradigm, which ignores the issue of, of excessive consumption, and also by the fact that the sector has been largely privatized. And there's the issue of fragmentation that also asks for, for smart grids for, for, for technical reasons as well. My second example is a specific from Brazil, a school in the north region of Brazil called Marabá Rural Campus. This is a photo of, the activi of an activity in, in the campus. It's a branch of a public higher education institute and it offers technical and undergrad degrees in fields such as agriculture and rural education. I find it an interesting case of communities trying to appropriate themselves of, straight, of state infrastructures, such as those of public education. This reading of mine uh, is based on the fact that the school is, f is focused, even through its student selection mechanisms, on peasant movements involved with land reform, on indigenous peoples and quilombos, which are former slave communities. While extremely diverse, the communities from those groups are usually very pro-commons, and in many cases, they are even strictly, strictly commons-based, sharing land and producing collectively. Along with workers' unions, those communities were di directly responsible for the pressure that led the government to build the school, only because of this pressure that the, the, the school was, was built this way. Even the land where, where it is located was, was donated by MST, which is the, the Brazilian Landless Workers Movement. 
the location is particularly relevant. It's surrounded by lots allocated to, to land reform in a town called, in a town called El Dorado dos Carajás. Uh, does that name ring a bell here in this room? Yeah. Well, that's where in, in 1996, 19 people were murdered by the police during, uh, during a, a manifestation for, for land reform. 10 of the 19 murdered were shot point blank. In a sense, this is really a battleground between commons-based initiatives on the one side and new extractivism and land speculation on the other. The, uh, the, the owner of a ranch on, on the region was, was charged of paying the police to, to, to murder the people, but he was never convicted. I also apologize for a cartoon that, unlike the others I've shown before, doesn't come even, co doesn't come even close to being funny. And I, I note that I sometimes quote the, the, the author when they give back to the commons, which is the case of Carlos Latouf. His cartoons are always copyleft. The Manaba campus has small-scale fam uh, small family farming, agroecology, and food sovereignty as its principles, and blends them with research focused on the community's needs and knowledges. One of the strategies to achieve this is, called, is the so-called alternation pedagogy. One-third of the students' formative time is spent in their respective communities. This allows for a richer educational process, minimizes rural exodus, and strengthens threatened ind indigenous cultures. There are definitely tensions in this example as well mostly in the, relation, in the relationship with the state. The Brazilian government since Lula, and including his government to, to a certain extent, shows a, la a lack of practical commitment to land reform. So the risk of cooptation in, in this case looms. There's also the issue of how to guarantee participative management. While this preoccupation is expressed in the, the school's institutional organization, it also depends a lot on struggles. Just to exemplify this, the dean of the larger institution the campus is, is attached to was, was jailed last year, accused of diverting millions of dollars. While the school lacked so much infrastructure, how ironical, that the students went on, went on a strike to ask for clean, clean water and uh, a bridge to be built so, they, they, so that they could reach the school when it was raining. Well... Thanks for, uh, for your attention. And before I finish, I, I, I would just like to give a special uh, thanks to St Stefan Meritz, who helped a lot in conceiving and preparing this talk. So a round of applause for him, please. <laughs> How are we in terms of time? Thank you, Miguel, and the other speakers as well. We have some time, and we wanted to use some of this time to get some uh, reaction, have some conversation, uh, even pose questions. But please don't consider this a question the experts uh, session. But more, you might have something to augment or complement what they said. You might like to provoke some questions to be raised in the breakout sessions later. So we'd like to use some of this time for, for some of that right now. Uh, and do we have a mic that we could have passed around? And if, uh, if some of the, the speakers would like to respond, please do, but we can, let's consider this a group conversation. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, David. Um, my name, again, is Richard Rosen. Um, I've worked uh, for decades on public utility regulation, so I could relate uh, strongly to the first two talks. And I think one very underappreciated point that Joshua so excellently put forward, but I want to repeat it, is because it comes up in, in, in all the kinds of areas we're talking about. Ultimately, even in commons or in commoning uh, products, you have to price the products and, unless you get rid of money completely. And, and the issue Joshua put forward, which I think is, is very underappreciated, and most people probably have never even heard it before, is that when you have 
uh, situations with very high fixed costs, okay, like water systems, like electricity systems, like many systems that deal with ecology, um, even farming. If there are high fixed costs and very low variable costs, it's, it's, it's completely sort of up in the air. It's undetermined how to price the product because certainly under capitalist accounting uh, procedures, you would tend to price the product very high at first so that profits can be made from the very first year. And then, in fact, the price would tend to decline as depreciation kicks in. Okay, but that's a, an arbitrary capitalist accounting kind of rule. But even in commoning or, or a more a socialist economy or any other economy, you have to think about how to price. And if you don't price the way capitalists tend to want to, with high prices at first and then lower prices over time, you're going to, quote, lose money. Okay, there, there are serious cash flow problems that then have to be dealt with in terms of debt, say, you know, borrowing mm -hmm. to subsidize the product for a while until the price of the product exceeds the, the, the value in the long run and the cost. So I'm, I'm just saying that this issue of high fixed investment, low variable cost is, as I say, very underappreciated and it's basically why water competition can't work, electricity competition, I point to the Germans here, can't work, markets for electricity cannot work because the investments are inherently 30, 40, 50 years <laughs> In duration, so it's a huge technical problem, but because it's so important, I think it has huge impacts in, in even how to think about commoning. I think that's an excellent issue to be discussed at greater length in the uh, infrastructure stream. I don't know if Miguel or others people might have some responses, but uh, it strikes me as a really fertile area to explore. Do we have other comments or thoughts to share with the group? Um, I've, um, Could you identify yourself? Yes, yeah, Pat Connolly, New Economics Foundation. I, I've been struck by what people have said, but I've also been struck by a failure to really say much about history. Insofar as if you know, the writings of Polanyi's analysis was, of course, in the in the Great Transformation in the in the 20th century, we have this problem of, on the one hand. We've had the false utopia of the free market, which we've seen collapse from 2008. On the other hand, we've had the, free, the false utopia of communism. And what he posed was a cooperative economy as a solution, and also recognizing that the cooperative economy since the beginning, in fact, even earlier, for the last 500 years, has been the counterweight uh, to the, the free market economy. And there is a sleeping giant. We've talked about the sleeping giant of municipalities uh, and how we could activate them to be for service rather than for profit. We talked about the uh, sleeping giant in passing of the cooperative movement. The cooperative movement today, and I do some work for Cooperatives UK, has done some research to show that today the cooperative movement employs more people than multinationals. The cooperative movement has almost one billion members. Internationally, the cooperative movement is serving every day three billion people. Mm. So that is a huge resource. So every we talk about commoning, but in fact, uh, you know, the cooperative commonwealth was the vision of, of Robert O and Proudhon, the whole cooperative movement, the whole socialist movement, and we 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 risk at our peril, starting with a blank page, mm. and not building on the foundations that are already there. Well, and then that, that, that's just a huge problem. And, and the cooperative movement has worked out the issue of, 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 of how you distribute and you decentralize and you democratize things that are intrinsically big. Mm -hmm. Look at the – look just for one example in Denmark. Denmark over the last 30 years has decentralized its energy through systems of wind guilds starting in rural areas and building partnerships with the local authorities mm – -hmm public social partnerships to capture 40% of the energy market in Denmark for the mutual sector. So it seems to me that actually without understanding the wisdom of working class self-help and mutual aid, mm -hmm. we risk starting with a blank piece of paper and reinventing the cooperative wheel. The cooperative wheel 
of the seven cooperative principles is critical. So how does that relate to the six principles we heard yesterday? Cooperative principles are weak on ecology in lots of areas, but they can be complemented with the resilience principles of ecological economics. So it's this coming together of the social... And in fact, in Daly's analysis in, in, in Beyond Growth, he poses two things. How do we bring together Polanyi's social economics with the ecological economics of, of Frederick Soddy, who said that actually wealth is sunshine. Mm-hmm. That is the source of all wealth, is energy. Thank you. Very, very useful comments. <laughs> yes, sir. I think it's an interesting uh, possibility. Uh, identify yourself. Yeah. Robin Purkast, All India People Science Network and Knowledge Commons. I think it's a very interesting proposition if we look at public utilities as a part of the commons. And one of the problems, of course, is the pricing, but I don't think that's the only problem there. I think that's a relatively simpler problem even within capitalism to handle because it has been handled earlier. I think really the issue that comes up is how do you make the public utilities accountable in terms of making them accountable to whom? The workers, to the governments that own them, they feel they own them, municipalities or the governments, or to the people they serve. And I think that's the principle on which we really have to look at because the failure of the public utilities model comes from the sense that they are alienated from the people they serve. And that has been the really the loophole through which neoliberal economics has managed to get the people behind them to try and privatize them. So I think that's the challenge that we have to face as commoners, if you will, how do you make the public utilities uh, accountable to the people in terms of the principles we are upholding? I think the economic part of it is we can leave to the economists who are not very good at it. Thank you, Prabir. We have some other thoughts and questions. Yes, Nicole. Uh, I'm Nicole Alix, and um, I'm here from... um, uh, so let's say a cooperative uh, or social and solidarity economy perspective. I just want to say one word because uh, had I been uh, invited to maybe to to do it, um, I just want to say that the, the cooperative movement on social and solidarity economy are interested in what's going on within the the, the common movements and the, with the, the commoners. And uh, you know that, David, because uh, you came and uh, Silke knows it too, Frederic. And I just want to say that uh, for us, it's a step. We have to, to gather and to understand more each other. There's no blank uh, paper. And uh, we will have a meeting in uh, Mont Blanc meeting in next uh, Chamonix uh, meeting in uh, November. And uh, we are a uh, few people who... Um, uh, intent to uh, organize a sort of workshop on something to discuss between the uh, cooperative movement, social and solidarity economy, and uh, the commoners. This is what I wanted to just to point it. Thank you for, for adding that, because there is a very rich tradition there uh, that Nicole speaks from. I mean, I would just, from speaking uh, personally, think that it's less of a blank slate than a confluence of a lot of different movements from different experiences and geographies and so forth. So it's less of a blank slate than discovering each other is how I would prefer to characterize it. But do we have some other issues or questions to uh, Philippe back there? Philippe Egrin. So I, I, I le- uh, though I love the Hugo Mathieu's talk, I think he stressed a very important point. I would like to, but the very important uh, challenge that has been raised by Heike Lutschmann uh, doesn't get, disappears in this discussion here because I think really uh, what she and, and Daniela Gottlich have, have uh, uh, put forward is basically is very hard problems that will fight bite they will bite us back if we don't uh, uh, give proper consideration to them. So uh, I, I will go to as a specific brand of feminist economic. I will I will go to this session and <laughs> I, I, I invite you to do so. <laughs> Thank you for actually, it reminds me, we, uh, Silke will be talking in a moment about the stream breakouts this afternoon and the procedures for it, but let me just 
interject at this moment, give some thought to the streams you'd like to associate with and have discussions because we, we need your intelligence. Soka will talk about that. But let's, we have a few minutes for a few more questions before Soka. Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Anne Snick, and I come from a network of expertise, uh, Flora, in Belgium. We develop expertise with women in poverty, not about them, but with them, to discover new ways of organizing um, socio-economic life so that everybody can be included, regardless of background and talents, etc. So we've done that for 20 years, and we have some very interesting insights. And I would also like to go back to the presentation about feminism, uh, because I think uh, what I I really liked it, except I thought it was narrowing uh, things down a bit because there was like this little image of a woman feeding a baby in a chair, and it's that is reproductive work. But I think you could also have put the duck in the chair, because that's where the link is with. It's not just about taking care of children or elderly people; it's taking care about the environment, and that's where the link is not with just with women's mm. work, but with everybody's work. And so I would like to maybe explore the hypothesis that the capacity to care is a commons. It's not just a role that certain people do where, while others do water maintenance or whatever, but the capacity to care is a, is a common human resource. And therefore, we're working on that. And I think what Hugo Matei said about all the legal infrastructures that uh, tend to privatize that, um, that those commons also apply to care as commons. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you take care of an elderly person in a paid context, it counts as work. If you take care of your own child, it's not considered work. Mm -hmm. So we're all obliged to pay somebody else to take care of our kids. So we pay the Polish woman who then pays the Ukrainian woman who then maybe has to pay somebody else or whatever. It's just crazy and stupid. So I would like to say that Hugo Matei's questions on how uh, law and labor law, etc., uh, uh, limit our capacity to see care as a human uh, co common resource. Also, it's not only concerning uh, natural, uh, whatever, uh, ecological resources, but they also apply to these human resources such as our caring capacity, uh, caring for future generations and for the environment and for the ducks, etc. So I think there's big links between the first and the second um, stream because the same questions appear over there, but I think in a more fundamental way in the caring uh, stream. So I, I also recommend <laughs> the, the... And stream. thank you for pointing out actually the overlap between the streams because I, I, I think that's really an important point. For example, the infrastructure stream bleeds into the knowledge stream and I think we should be mindful of this as we have these conversations. Yes, there. Uh, Gary Flumenhoff from Vermont. I wanted to comment mostly on Hugo, but a few others. Um, I guess there's some differences between continental and Anglo-Saxon law because we have common law, and somebody was saying we don't have any laws you know, t t uh, on our side. Well, we have the public trust doctrine, which protects surface water and groundwater, among other things. Uh, and I don't think, and, and also some statutory laws, like the airways, which are belong to the public. And I don't think we do enough to to use the legal system on our behalf. Um, but I wanted to talk about a paradox with groundwater uh, because it's a uh, public trust resource in our state, so it means it belongs to the public. And I've worked on trying to get bottlers and commercial users to pay fees. For, and the, the paradox is that public water supplies pay a fee to the state to manage water, but private uh, water users do not. And so... We've tried to advocate that they should also pay a fee. And our biggest opponents are the, are the people who are against commodification of water. They say we should not collect fees because that would commodify water, which is a strange paradox I just wanted to point out. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Uh, over there, uh, gentlemen. Well, my name is Kai Illas. I'm a researcher uh, working in transformation questions in Soviet Union, earlier Soviet Union, Mongolia and China. And I would like to remind the audience that we should 
talk about this big part of the world too, which has lost its community, its collectivism, its commons, its a very old common culture by privatization in the last 25 years. And, it's very, and people are struggling for new forms of commons, for defending commons in that part of the world. And I would like that we took that part of the world into our commons discussion. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we have a question up here. Mayo. Uh, I have enjoyed a lot uh, yesterday's uh, talk and today on the point of uh, the importance of uh, building relationships. And this is uh, under the idea of the importance of commoning and not only the common as a resource. And uh, I, I wonder how the, the stream about uh, money and, uh, and value could, uh, all of them, but could uh, think about how we can uh, uh, value and, and visualize the importance of building relationships. And I am saying this because I, I work as an academic and I, I, I have dedicated most of my time to building relationships, like organizing events. And when I do research, I also do research with the people I I, I, I I research the, on the topics, but then I am valuable by, and I am judged by the element if I publish, and I have not been publishing a lot, and now I am being uh, um, uh, affected by this, and I have not been promoted or given prizes because of this, and and this is not only in the in the in the university or in the market. This is also inside of the commons, in the sense of you see in Wikipedia. Uh, the, in Wikipedia, we value a lot who edit, who create the articles, but we don't value, for example, as much like who organize Wikimania or who organize the meetings or who take care that everybody feel welcoming. And 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 this is a this is very important because we focus too much about the outcome and not the building relationships. And and this would be also a way of integrating more women because it's not just a coincidence that if you look the rate of gender in editing Wikipedia, it's much more uh, male-dominated than if you see who is actually doing the building relationships inside of uh, Wikipedia. And the same on the universities, on publishing and taking care of building relationships inside. Thank you. Well, thank you for all these comments. I think we should move on to the uh, preparations for this afternoon, but uh, all of these are really useful comments to ponder, and let's try to address and develop them more in the stream.